Welcome back to another podcast for Save It for the Blind. I'm Carson Odegaard, Hunt Program Coordinator for CWA. And today we have a pretty hot topic uh, for California waterfowl hunters. It's going to be the Klamath Basin. And our guests today are very reputable in talking about that area. The first is going to be CWA's president, John Carlson. Our second is going to be Mark Henley, who is VP of Advocacy. And then we have a guide that guides up in that area, Phil Brown. So, gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having Thank us. You. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's going to be great. We're going to learn a lot. I'm pretty sure this podcast is going to be one of the most viewed as it is a hot button um, topic within the waterfowl world of the Klamath Basin. So to start out, I mean, this podcast is getting filmed, what are we, three days before waterfowl season up here in the, the general balance of the state. So, John, do you have any plans for, for the opener? You know, to be totally honest, I usually don't hunt the opener. Yeah. I grew up I grew up back east hunting in snow and ice. So the idea of hunting with sunscreen and uh, <laughs> mosquitoes mosquito that'll repellent, carry you away. <laughs> it you know, if I get a great invitation or get a reservation, yeah. which don't happen all the time on opener, um, I put in for a lot of reservations for this weekend. I've got zero. So <laughs> uh, I'm catching up on honeydews this weekend because yeah. the season's long and by that the end of the season my freezer's full. California is a marathon, not a sprint. That's for yeah. sure. Yep. Mark, what about yourself? I was going to say you and everybody else have zero, <laughs> zero reservations. <laughs> yeah. It's become the trend. Somebody's got to actually. Get one. Okay. On that note, I was lucky enough to get drawn for Modox. I've already been up to the northeast okay, zone. There you go. Yeah. Took my kids up there. We had a great hunt. I'd say two thirds of the birds we shot were mallard or sprig, and got a couple honkers. Came right into the decoys. That was nice. And so, yeah, that was uh, good to get, uh, um, you know, season off to a good start. Yeah. And then coming up, I, we got a, uh, a number six, I believe, at Sac Refuge with okay. my son. So you're um, already starting off. Oh, well. yeah, I know. Got a little you're draw rolling. there. Didn't get drawn for the opener, though. But uh, And then um, another one for Delavan for the following week. So. Yeah. So Let's see how it goes. Phil, I know you're in a little bit of different world being a, being a guide up in the – that area but how's how's the season starting up there uh we started the seventh and uh you know we're allowed to hunt on Thule lake national wildlife refuge but only in dry fields so any of the typical water units are closed this year um it's i don't know it's bittersweet to have the refuge open and see all the birds that are there but you can't really hunt them right now yeah we're gonna dive into that today so um as CWA and as our nonprofit goes, we have major push towards getting water back in the Klamath Basin, whether it's uh, Lower Klamath National Wildlife Refuge or Thule Lake or anywhere in between the refuges up there. So I'll give the question to both of you guys and whoever would like to answer. So what did we do this year in 2023 to kind of move forward in getting um, the water situation into a better position, whatever it may be? So, if I may, there, there's a couple of things that we've done. Um, I mean, overall, our strategy is to go out and purchase the water for the refuge. You know, there's a lot of talk about doing various things up there, but if they don't acquire water, they really aren't going to amount to much for the refuge. So, um, one of the things we did was work with the Klamath Drainage District and purchased, I think it was 2,500 acre feet of water, and that was delivered in the spring to Unit 2, you know, the main sanctuary unit by mm -hmm. the highway. And then we also have this ongoing, you know, water rights acquisition. We're working with the landowner. Um, it's for a little over 3,700 acre feet. And fortunately, that water was able to... Uh, start i think in maybe june it was shut off for a while but then we had another shot of that um in late august and into september and that kept unit two up and, and okay. because of those you know efforts there were waterfowl broods hundreds of waterfowl broods that survived there were quite a few molting birds that made it luckily we did not have a botulism outbreak yeah so you're saying this year was better yes, than last year with the cooler temperatures we really lucked out with that but um that definitely um you know provided some benefits for the waterfowl resource so we're really happy about that okay good no that's that's i think where we need to to head and 
What's what's our biggest hurdle in you know those acquisitions? Uh, the biggest <laughs> hurdle. There's several. Um, yeah, there's certainly several. <laughs> several. And, so, and, and let's let's dive into that. What are those? S- certainly, okay. money is one, I and mean, okay. we've got to secure the funding. So, CWA, we have been paying up to this point for most of that purchase. Um, we have gotten some um, extra money from the state of California. We put in a grant, um, and where it was awarded a grant through the state of Oregon, so that will help out. Um, but yeah, most of it has been through the donations of our members, which we really appreciate. Uh, ultimately, though, the federal government, I mean, they're the ones that own the refuge. Yeah. They're the ones that manage it. <laughs> yep. They need to step in and provide you know, the lion's share of that funding. And they do have, I believe it's $8 million on hand right now to help complete this first water uh, okay. rights purchase. So hopefully that will be forthcoming here in the next few months. So would you say as a whole we're moving in the right direction consistently? Definitely, yeah. Good. It's, you know, Klamath is always slow and frustrating, but yes, we are definitely heading down the right road. And then, you know, the eventual hope is once we get this first water rights purchase done is to try to then go to other neighboring landowners mm-hmm. in Oregon, the Wood River Valley, and try to get those um, landowners to sell their water. It's all voluntary, but uh, there's about 30,000 acre feet total um, available up there. So if the refuge was to acquire all that, that would provide a significant bump in their water allocation every year. Okay, very nice. And John, I know you were in back in Washington D.C. a few weeks ago with Mark. The yeah. two of us were there. Yep. Was was this a topic that was brought up a lot or discussed over there? Is is this something that's on the national scale? Oh, definitely, definitely. We brought this up uh, for the last two years in a row in Washington D.C. Actually, many more years than that. We we bring that up every year. Um, and when you asked about hurdles, so mm-hmm. some of the biggest hurdles are the Federal Endangered Species Act, um, the fisheries that are up there, the, uh, the salmon and the suckers, you know, they come first with water up there. And that's the way the law is written. That's the way it's managed. That's the way things are going right now. So, you know, the amount of water that's up there, the competition for that water, they're first in line. The refuge has been last in line for a while now. We also, of course, have irrigators and farmers up there that need their water. So it's it's a tough landscape. It's a very, um, you know, we are making progress for sure, but yeah. it is tough. And so when we were there, we had meetings with several legislators, several congressmen that um, are familiar with the Klamath and have been very helpful to us. We're also trying to get some others towards our side. And then we had a, a really good meeting with the assistant secretary at the uh, Department of Interior, Matt Strickler, who, um, you know, he works, you know, he's over the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and, Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Reclamation. I mean, he's, he's high up in the organization. So he's, this has okay. been, this has come to his attention a lot. So it's kind of trying to get it up to the right person to, to really get those wheels moving. For sure. And the wheels are moving. But as Mark said, federal wheels move slower <laughs> slower than uh, and not to give them a hard time, but they have a lot of things they have to deal with. They have a lot of politics they have to deal with. They have a lot of uh, competing needs for their money also. So to get on the national, you know, to get on the national radar is a big, a big deal. And CWA, through this effort, time and time again, congressmen and and the folks at the Department of Interior thanked us for getting it on the national uh, stage, well, good. no doubt and, about it. Yeah, it sounds like the work we're doing is is paying off. And I mean, I have hunted up there my whole life, and I've driven through that refuge when it's fully flooded. And the last couple of years, it's been completely empty. And I was up there actually a couple of weeks ago helping a buddy on a deer hunt, and drove through, and there was you know water off the highway, and there was water in one B on the the Tule Lake side, and it was it was great to see. So, Phil. You being up there, kind of actively, what are you? What are you seeing on the ground as far as you know, ducks using the landscape that is currently flooded? Yeah, it's vastly different than last year. You know, I live maybe a mile from the refuge. Um, I've been guiding up here for over thirty years now, and so I've seen all these changes since two thousand and one. Um, 
Lower Klamath slowly dying. I, you know, I don't know. The whole dynamic, Lower Klamath and Tule Lake are right next to each other. Some people don't even realize that there's the two main refuges on the California side. Um, Tule Lake had been pretty safe for a long time. And when the lake went dry, when, whenever they decided they were doing that, uh, it was devastating to watch. And so as it was dry last year, I spent some time driving around down there. No blackbirds even, no ducks, no geese, nothing in the ditches. Uh, the birds that were migrating in, working in my shop here, you can hear them and they would come over and they would get down into, into where Tule Lake should be. And then they would circle back up here and then they would just disappear into the distance. So it was a rough thing to watch last year. So with this little bit of water we have, it's it's an amazing comeback. You know, there's just today when I was down there, there's closed zone fields that have, you know, 100,000 birds in them. So seeing that back, seeing the deer come back, seeing more pheasants, uh, it, it is really amazing. It, it didn't take much to get them back. Well, that's, you know, that's an amazing thing that even just a little bit of effort, a lot of water will will bring back a whole ecosystem that's up yeah. there that kind of died out for a little bit. Yeah, it, it is just water. You know, I've heard people say they're worried about the birds not coming back to the Klamath Basin, but it's the heart of the Pacific Flyway. And as soon as there's water here, the birds are here. So it it doesn't take much. You know, it, it, like you said, a lot of water. Um, right now, Unit 2 on Lower Klamath side has some water in it. And just to give the people kind of a idea of that, there's 50,000 acres on Lower Klamath Refuge. And you've got about 6,000 acres in Unit 2 that has some water in it. And then the rest is bone dry. And then on the Tule Lake side, you've got Sump 1B, which is a smaller uh, water unit that is full. And then you've got Sump 1A, which has water in it now. And even out there, just with uh, the growth that you have, stinging nettles and whatever else is out there, there's thousands of birds using the lake right now. Yeah, well, it's it's good to see, and hopefully we can only improve from here on out and make it back to what it used to be or an extent of that um, at some point. So we kind of discussed about, you know, what we did this year and last year to acquire those rights. What is What do we have projected in the future and what, what are our goals going forward for this project? Well, certainly one of the things that we have to do too, so it's, it's water rights acquisition, but it's also getting the biological opinions that govern the water deliveries up there to include the refuge's water needs. So for layman's terms, break that down. Yeah. So in the Klamath River and the Klamath Lake where water, you know, comes from uh, to serve the Klamath project, mm -hmm. there's endangered fish, suckers. Um, in the river, there's salmon. And these... Um, you know, endangered species, they have biological opinions that govern what can and cannot be done with their water supply. And um, years ago, the, the refuge was actually considered um, as part of that analysis, and it actually received water through those biological opinions. Unfortunately, over the years, that has petered out, and the refuge's water needs are no longer considered. So we want to get that back incorporated in. Um, there's actually a couple of uh, water rights that Lower Klamath has that um, if they would be recognized through the opinions, that would guarantee some water for them. Oh, wow. Okay. They're, they're a priority water rights. And so that's a, a big focus. But also just having the refuge's water needs included would ensure that if agriculture, you know, once you meet the needs of ag, if there was any water left over, then the refuge would get that water. So this is something, it's not a silver bullet um, by any means, but it's something that would provide a more reliable supply of water over the long term if we were to go back to that. Gotcha. I know being up there personally for multiple years and seeing how the refuge has changed, and this might be, you know, an everybody question. Back in the day, there was a talk of a geothermal plant that was going <laughs> to get put in, and I've seen the I've seen the pipes in the ground. What what happened? I'm sure we're going to have questions. What happened with the the geothermal, and, and why didn't that work out? 
Yeah, and the refuge manager, um, to his credit, Ron Cole at the time, he got us involved and we wrote some support letters on it. And I think um, just eventually they came back and the geothermal company decided it wasn't economically feasible for them to do that. But what that would have done is created then, you know, this uh, source of power that would then have helped to control the power costs. You know, pumping water up there is unbelievably expensive. There was a 2006 compact that kept um, power rates artificially low for the refuge. That expired. Oh, okay. And when that happened, you really saw a lot less water flowing through the hill and a lot less water being pumped around the refuge. So getting those costs under control would, at least with the available water, it would allow you then to, to put it where you need to. Um, in an inexpensive way. So it's unfortunate the project didn't go forward, but um, again, that's why we need to come up with other solutions now. And yeah, and we think one of, again, one of the the best ones out there is this water rights acquisition. That seems to hold the it most It seemed promise. to work so far. Yeah. I mean, even on a small scale, so why can't it be done on a big scale, you know? Correct. And this is the same strategy, by the way, that they did for neighboring Stillwater Refuge. In, okay in uh, Nevada and Stillwater now, after many years of acquiring water rights, has a much more reliable supply of water. Um, hasn't totally fixed everything for them, but they're, they're a lot more secure than they were 15, 20 years ago. Well, that's where we can hope we can be yeah. at some point with Klamath and Tule Lake is just be more secure than we are today. You know? that's, our, that's our whole goal is yeah. to get permanent water yeah. and they have it secure. So, you know, talking about our goals and what we've done, and this may be a Mark or a John question, what are some of the misconceptions that you guys hear about, you know, CWA and our efforts to restore Klamath? Because I see Facebook posts, and it's like, oh, you guys aren't doing anything or this and that. We, we try to, you know, um, publish as much as we can, but what are some of the misconceptions that can be easily answered for what we're doing in our work to help out Lower Klamath and Tule Lake? I think, you know, the folks that don't think we're doing anything, they've, uh, they're not really reading up on what's been mm -hmm. going on. And to me, what really turns the heads in Washington, D.C. and our partners, other organizations that are in the conservation game, when we tell them that through our members, our private members, we've raised $1.5 million over the last few years, that's out of the pockets of our private members. That's amazing. So, you know, that gets people's attention. That, that gives us a lot of skin in the game. And, of course, our efforts um, on getting grants from both the state of Oregon, the state of California, and the feds that you know leverages all that money. So we're in this for the long mm -hmm. run, and we've got the backers. We've got dedicated, passionate members that are putting their hard-earned money up because they know how important this is. So that, to me, is a really big point that some people, I guess, are missing. And, and I mean, maybe they're missing it because, you know, they're expecting it to be a snap of the finger and all of a sudden yeah. Lower Klamath has full water. And it's, it's never, it's never going to be like that no matter what we do. It's going to be over time. Um, hopefully, eventually, we get, get those water rights purchased. So do you have any misconceptions that you hear um, that are incorrect and we can straighten out? Well, I tell you, the historical one actually had some truth to it. And for many years, CWA would go to the Bureau of Reclamation in August and beg and plead for water. And people saw that as a Band-Aid approach and not something that was sustainable, not something that, you know, permanently solved the problem. And so we really have transitioned away from that to, again, these more durable solutions. We want to, you know, if there are opportunities to buy, again, short-term water, we certainly will look at that and support them if they're warranted. But really the main focus has to be on on permanent changes up there. Yeah. We want to do things that are meaningful and that are going to last and really benefit the refuge over the long term. Yeah, definitely. Phil, as, as a guy that's up there, the clients that you have, are many of them aware of what's going on, say, with CWA's efforts to restore uh, the Klamath Basin? I think they are. Um, you know, most of most of my clients are members of CWA. Um, I guess the biggest thing is people don't realize that if you don't do what you guys are doing, going to Washington, then things are going to fall apart. Um, 
the local staff here, the guys that work on the refuge here, they're, I mean, pretty much on a gag order. If you look at their website, it doesn't even say there's a drought. Um, driving around the refuge, I talked to bird watchers that came and there's no birds, there's no water, uh, you know, over the summer. And I asked them why they came and they said they looked at the website and heard it was a great place. Um, so there, I mean, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife doesn't even really acknowledge the fact that the place is dried up. Um, going up the chain, it's just crazy. But what CWA is doing politically, that's where the, the war is. And for somebody like me, you know, I write letters to the Bureau of Reclamations, the Secretary of the Interior, everybody I can think of, and I don't get any response at all. And so having somebody that's got power behind them going out there and doing this, that's that's where it's at. Yeah, and, and that kind of brings me to an, another question that pops up is, you know, how can the average person, the CWA supporter, um, make an impact, even if it's a small impact, on what we're doing? I mean, what's what's the best way? Oh, yeah, well, you know, from what I've seen, it is putting, putting the money towards uh, your efforts, really, because anything you do as a private citizen, they, they don't care. There's no one in the government that cares. Yeah, and along those lines, I would say that, you know, I agree with Phil when we, when we, and I'm not kidding, when we tell them how much money we've raised from private citizens, that turns their head. And so a lot of our donations are $25 donations. Um, some are $100,000 donations. But when we add it all up and we tell people that, you know, we've got over 20,000 members and that um, people are reaching into their pocket for this, I agree with Phil. It, that's, that's a way you can help make a difference. That's the way you can be part of the yeah. Equation. So so even if it's twenty five dollars, you know, you don't feel like you're making a difference, but you are making a difference. No doubt, it, it all it all adds up in the end. Yep. And I mean, that's amazing that as a conservation group such as CWA can go in and make a difference in you know the political world of Washington D.C. We come in there and say, hey, this is what we've done, and catch people's attention to fix an issue. Um, I personally, I mean. I'm 29 years old. I've, I've hunted Klamath a long time. You guys have more experience. Have you ever seen a bigger, um, you know, natural, not a natural disaster, but a loss of habitat to this extent in your career that shouldn't have happened? No, and, and I like the word disaster, but I'll call it a man-made political disaster. It's a disaster. Yeah. It's a disaster. And I, I, I got in trouble a few years ago. The Sacramento Bee interviewed me, and I said, to me, it's like the environmental crime of the century. Yeah. And after that, there were some folks who took it personal <laughs> up north, and uh, they met with Congressman LaMalfa, and they wanted my butt. I mean, they wanted me, and, and he had my back. He said, listen, you know, Carlson's not blaming the farmers. It was the farmers thought I was blaming them. I'm yeah. not. I'm blaming the Bureau of Reclamation and certain... Uh, certain parts of the Fish and Wildlife Service. I mean, how can the Fish and Wildlife Service let a refuge that was first set up for waterfowl by Teddy Roosevelt go dry? I mean, it's mind-boggling. It's for, you know, just on that level for a normal person, it's like, what the hell is going on here? So it's yeah. very tough. Very yeah, tough. It's, it's a staple in a lot of, you know, California Hunter's life, people that grew up in California, the, the youth hunt up there has been my first ever hunt was at Tule Lake. My second ever hunt was at Lower Klamath. And I go to those same exact spots and they're dry. And it's it's a sh it's a shame to see. And every I've, you know, heard it from far and wide, the the same story. Um and me not being in the the political aspect of it, that's why I wanted to know like how how big of a situation is have you, Mark, seen anything bigger than this in our lifetime with, um, I don't know, a natural resources screw up? No, this is by far the biggest one. And it's a, just an absolute travesty. I mean, you look at what a, in the other parts of California, you know, we've been able to increase our wetland acreage and do some great things. We are having some trouble now with this whole Sigma implementation, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, that may have some uh, negative impacts on wetland acreage, acreage down in the Can San you Joaquin go into Valley. a little bit of that about what's going to happen with that, just so people that don't know exactly yeah, what that act so is? Th 
It's a groundwater, essentially, restriction on pumping over time in certain overdrafted basins. Okay. And so Tulare is one of those overdrafted mm-hmm. basins. We have a number of duck clubs down there. We have the Kern Refuge. I yep. think even Mendota be, might be part of that area. And so they're going to, over the next 20, 20 plus years, ratchet down how much you can pump out of the ground. Okay. And so some of the duck clubs, frankly, down there may go out of business. Um, I wanted to say earlier, too, you know, how much, though, Klamath means to hunters. And me personally, too, I had my daughters cut their teeth on hunting yeah. at Lower Klamath. They shot their first birds at s- Unit 6. Unit 6. <laughs> and then yeah. for many years, we went to the Stearns unit and had some great hunts out there. Yeah. I will tell you, the biggest flock of waterfowl I have ever seen in a hunt area anywhere on any public area, and I've hunted three quarters of them throughout the state, um, was on Tule Lake Refuge on a flooded grain field. Um, right next door to that, the largest flock of Canada geese that I ever saw flying around at one time uh, was right there in the Klamath Basin, right next to um, um, uh, the, the uh, Oregon Straits. And so, you know, it just shows that if you provide the right habitat, you provide the water, that place can be unbelievably yeah. productive. And, of course, it's also a very important, you know, place for our local mallards. If we're going to, you know, address the decline in local mallards um, it, throughout the rest of California, we've got to fix what's going on up in Klamath because a lot of those birds not only breed up there, but they molt there too. You know, several years ago, we lost 60,000 waterfowl. Most of those were our local mallards that perished from botulism. So um, we need to fix it if we're going to have better hunting opportunity for mallards throughout the state. Yeah, any any direction that's in the right way is, is just a step in the right way. Like I said, it might not happen overnight, but over the years, if we can get there, you know, we can bring back that that refuge. is. Is there any partners that we work with that also contribute to, you know, the help of what we're doing or what we're aiming for? There's many, actually. So right now we're working with Nature Conservancy, um, Audubon Society. Um, they've been really helpful with this whole water rights acquisition strategy. Good partners. Sustainable Northwest is a group group up in Oregon, a kind of a more... Um, Pure Environmental Group, they have helped us out with some of our grant applications. And then, um, you know, John mentioned earlier, the state of California has kicked in money, uh, which has been great. The state of Oregon also is going to be supporting the water rights acquisition um, that we're working on right now. Have we been able to receive any federal money yet? uh, We have not gotten that part yet. Yeah. So that hopefully again will be forthcoming. There's 8 million sitting there just for this purpose of purchasing water rights. So as long as some other boxes are checked here soon, those funds uh, should be expended. But then we have also, you know, gotten other groups like the Pacific Flyway Council. They wrote a letter in support of this water rights acquisition strategy. Of course, they represent states up and down the, the Pacific Flyway. Um, CWA, we're on an um, advisory committee to the Biden administration called the Hunting and Wildlife Conservation Council. Okay. And they just released a letter um, requesting that the Secretary of Interior support this water rights acquisition wow. strategy and, frankly, also um, look at the biological opinions and make sure that the refuge's water needs are included there. And so we're, we're getting some high-level folks to weigh in. Uh, so people are starting to wake up about the situation. Definitely. Sure. And when you talk about the biological opinions, I know, do those have time frames on them where they have to be redone at a certain point? Every five years, there's yeah, they're, they're essentially reviewed. And where and are we at in ours right now? So right now, I believe we're under an interim operations plan. So I don't know exactly when um, the next – you know, opportunity will be for review and comment, but I have heard that the Bureau is al- already working on a draft. So I believe it'll be sometime in the next year or two that we'll be able to uh, get another uh, shot at doing that. Okay. And I know some people might have questions such as like, you know, 
Wireloa or Klamath and Tule Lake not getting water, but Butte Valley Wildlife Area has water and it's full. So can you answer that question for us? Yeah, the, those other areas just have different water rights. When I was also up at Modoc, I mean, much of that refuge was flooded up mm -hmm. and they looked in really good shape. And it's all about your water rights. And so it's a se separate water rights, different areas. Right. They're, exactly. they're able to get there. All refuges up and down the state have different water rights. And, you know, making sure if you're going to establish a refuge that it has good water supplies and good water rights is obviously really key. Yeah. And so that's really what was missing from Lower Klamath. Okay. Try not to have endangered species upstream. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that'll complicate <laughs> things really quickly. That's, that's too. the first goal is yeah. hopefully get no endangered species upstream well, where your water is. <laughs> but I mean, you know, when the, most of the land was acquired for Lower Klamath, the, the Endangered Species Act hadn't even passed. So they right. didn't even know right. about it at the time. And I think that's, that on that's where a lot of people. Um, that may not be in the know are confused about, you know, how does this refuge that has been around for such a long time have these lower water rights compared to the seniorities of other folks? And maybe you guys can either touch on that. Like, why is the refuge almost at the bottom of the barrel when this is such an important place compared to other entities? So the Klamath Reclamation Act, it was set up for farming. And so that priority has to come first. Uh, that's one reason. The refuge historically, um, because there was a lot of water up there, the farmers would use it, was always getting drain water from the farmers, and it just never was an issue. And so really this came to a head most going back to the endangered species when the biological opinions were starting to be enforced. You know, if you remember back in 2001, we had the, the bucket brigade and there was a big crisis up in the basin because all of a sudden um, water was really being taken away from farmers, away from the project, and given over to the endangered species needs. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of where we're at then now is there's a big battle um, as to how that water, you know, after they meet the needs of not just endangered spe species, but also tribal obligations, those are also now, you know, part of the mix. You know, how much water is left over? Well, unfortunately, agriculture then gets the next um, crack at that, and then the refuge is at the bottom of the barrel. They're the last yeah. in line to get water. And so um, if there was ever a able to uh, be some legislation that would give the refuge more equity there, you know, that's something that would really help out. There was a bill, the Klamath Basin Restoration Act, um, that was in Congress several years ago, but unfortunately it died, and we don't see that being re resurrected anytime okay. soon. So in the meanwhile, again, our strategy is then go out and purchase the water rights themselves. Yeah, that's, that's been yeah. the most solid, backed yep. option that we have. Phil, as somebody who's up there all the time, who lives in that area, what are you seeing? And this is a you know a prediction for the year. How do you feel like this year is going to play out, um, duck numbers wise, goose number wise, as compared to previous years? Since we do have a little bit more water on the landscape. Well, I mean, compared to last year, we're a hundred percent more waterfowl here. Um, you know, lower climate is it's just dry. Uh, unit two up there closed unit has some water in it uh, unit three is dry across the street in the straits unit uh they are flooding some farm fields up there and there's there's a massive water file population there that are some of them are going into unit two to rest and some of them are coming to Tule lake um sitting in the sump and in sump 1a uh it's a major change right now um you know, and all these political things that go on with the tribes and the farmers and the endangered species act I'm hoping that some of these guys are coming together. It sounds like the refuge staff here is making some headway, um, but everybody needs to kind of come together. And the ag community is a big part of Tule Lake. So when they normally would irrigate, it would come right out of Tule Lake. So they're, the ag community here in Tule Lake, uh, Tule Lake Irrigation District, they're, they're really trying to get water in Tule Lake. That's their their whole goal right now um they want to go back to normal farming practices and they've always taken their water out of the lake which supports all the wildlife and then sump 1b is another place where they stored water 
so they are uh, really working on that right now. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping we get a winner. You know, some of the other watersheds here, we have Clear Lake, which is to the east. Uh, the last time Lower Klamath really had water was 2017, and Clear Lake was at 109% of capacity. So that floods Tule Lake, and then they're forced to run D plant, which pumps water through the hill to Lower Klamath. And so Lower Klamath had been a dead zone for years. And then in 2017, when that water hit it, it was it was insanity. Um, the one of the places I hunted was a, a grain field, uh, Unit 4A, which is huge. And just driving the boat out in the morning, the birds coming out of that field, my whole boat deck would be covered in duck poop. <laughs> and the clients don't stop talking about that. <laughs> so, you know, I'm hoping all these entities will come together. Yeah. No. Definitely. And. You um, being kind of the expert for for up in that area, for people that aren't aware, what are the hunting options that they have currently? What are the non-hunting options that they have currently up in that area? So right now, the hunting opportunities are on Tule Lake only, Tule Lake side. Uh, You can hunt in field units. So, uh, you know, if you're coming up this way, you definitely need to get a map. There's already been some some closed zone hunters. Um, I jokingly like to say that if you see a bunch of birds there, it's probably closed (laughs) to hunting. Uh, You know, you can hunt these dry fields. Uh, They are flooding some of the fields. It's going very slow. Um, I haven't seen, like even today, driving around the refuge, I saw two uh, hunters out there on the whole refuge, two parties hunting, which is, you know, this used to be like the Mecca you had farming and then you had hunting. And, and so, um, if you're coming up this way, just don't expect a lot, you know? Yeah, no, that's totally understandable. And hopefully we can have you back on in a few years and you can say the exact opposite and expect a lot. and You can hunt anywhere, you know, that's, that's what we're working towards. Uh, I would love to, I would love to do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it just this change. It is. It's great to see the birds here. You know, you, you go out there and and there's geese flying everywhere. There's there's a bunch of snows here right now. There's a bunch of specks right here, right now, and uh, the Canada geese are everywhere. Um, it, it just looks awesome. Um, there's a lot more opportunity for bird watchers. I can tell you that. Good. Well, that's still that's still out recreation. You know, helping us out. I'm just hoping that uh, that we do see it come back. You yeah, know, and, and the efforts have to be political. So definitely. Do you guys have anything you want to add to um, anything within the Lower Klamath Basin discussion, whether it be political, personal? What do you have, John? So um, I just wanted to bring this up that in March of this year, uh, Assistant Deputy Secretary of Interior Matt Strickler came out from D.C. and hosted a two day conference on the Lower Klamath up in Ashland. And I was, uh, CWA was invited. I went up to rep- represent CWA. And the fir- the evening, the first evening, they had a cocktail, informal cocktail get together. Those are where you really get things done. Mm-hmm. And I was able to meet irrigators, farmers, uh, water district officials, tribal members, tribal leaders, uh, leaders from the Bureau of Reclamation, leaders from the Fish and Wildlife Service, other nonprofit groups were there. Um, and when I explained what we were trying to do to each of these folks over a drink privately, they all, tribes, farmers, irrigators, folks that had grown up there, and like Phil said, you know, 30, 40 years ago, saw all these birds, they all really liked what we were trying to do. Then the next day, we had the formal session <laughs> with about 200 people in the room, and you had all these entities. And I was blown away by how much animosity and anger was in the room. You had water districts fighting with each other. You had irrigation districts fighting with each other. You had um, tribes fighting amongst them. You know, There was like five tribes up there. Tribes are not happy with each other, depending on where they are on the pecking order for water. Um, And then, of course, you've got farmers fighting with tribes and tribes fighting with farmers. And the one common denominator was they all disliked the Bureau of Reclamation deeply. Everybody did. 
based on the way they're managing the water. So it just really made me realize <clears throat> the work we're doing is so important, but this is a long haul. This is not an easy political situation. And, and like Phil was saying, you know, we, we hope everybody comes together and gets gets together on this with a common goal. <clears throat> and we just have to keep the work up and keep it going. And I think if everybody realizes, one of the tribes, a mallard is sacred to them. Really? We realized that, that at that meeting that you know, in some of their ancient headdress, mallards were a big part of it. Are they and able so, to harvest them when they go out? Or is it a protected bird, you know? Right now, it didn't sound like they were really going after them anymore right Interesting. now. Interesting. That's, so, that's very cool. But when they heard about our restoration efforts, yeah. they loved it. Huh. So I just wanted to lay that out that, you know, having somebody come in all the way out from Washington, D.C. and pulling everybody together, it's, it's, it, it is great. But it re- we all realized, including Matt Strickler from D.C., that it is very tough. Yeah. Very tough. Uh, too many cooks in the kitchen, apparently. Well, and there's a lot of you know, there's a lot at stake for everybody. Yeah, it's it's not a small button and issue. Still, a lot of anger in the room. Definitely, Mark. What about you? You have any closing remarks? Yeah, I mean, earlier we talked about what folks can do to yeah. help with the effort. So one of the things I think would be very important is call your local congressman or email them, call our our senators and. Put this on the map for them. I mean, we do have a number of congressmen that are very supportive, as John mentioned, on this issue, and I'll just name a couple of them. Uh, Representative LaMalfa, whose district goes up into the Klamath area. Um, Jared Huffman, who's more coastal. Mike Thompson, who is um, uh, more coastal as well. And then um, John Garamendi. They've been great. Um, but that's only four out of our, you know, entire delegation, which is many more people. So, yeah, getting uh, that information over to them, I think, would help to highlight the issue and get mm-hmm. them more involved. And then um, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, in terms of solutions, there also is a solution out there that uh, people are looking at ways, how can we more historically connect the river and the lake back okay. into the wetlands yeah. and almost have a flow through system. You know, the way the water used to work up there, you'd have flooding that would come off of the lake and the river and that would flow down to essentially where lower Klamath is. And you're referring to the lake as upper Klamath Lake? Upper Klamath Lake, okay. correct. And then it would flow then back out mm-hmm. into the river system. And if we could get a more natural regime like that, that could provide a lot of benefit. Um, also, you know, there's been efforts to establish, you know, kind of temporary populations of uh, the endangered suckers over at the refuge. Finally, getting a permanent population over there. I mean, let's use that uh, to our advantage to get water. If we could get a real thriving population going there, then conceivably, you know, they would need to yeah, send so, water to so the refuge. Using, just, using their own weapons against correct, them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, but I mean, that's smart. There would be all this benefit then <laughs> yeah. for waterfowl. Yeah, that's and, smart. You know, one of the greatest ecological benefits for waterfowl up there is that spring and summer water again for mm-hmm. breeding and for molting. I mean, if we could get water during those time periods, that could really help with the just overall health of the ecosystem up there. So... That's something I think is gaining more traction. It sounds like some of the tribes are even interested in that. Um, but you could argue that you know it could help to recover those fish populations, yeah, but 100%. also provide these significant benefits for the refuge. If you're providing them, you know, the suckers with habitat while also you know giving us water for the waterfowl, I mean, I don't see how that's a bad yeah. option at all. Exactly. And a, a lot of folks now, when it comes to these kind of controversial issues, they're looking for multi-benefit type uh, projects. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't just make it about one species or another. So that certainly fits that bill. And um, I think there's there's growing interest in this type of solution. Yeah. No, that first time I've heard of that, and in in my mind, you know, sitting behind a desk, it makes sense. So one of the one of the options to to move this thing forward to get us in a better spot. Phil, do you have any any closing remarks you'd like to add? Well, I'm just uh, along that sucker line. Uh, Tule Lake has always had a population of suckers. Uh, the Lost River terminates into Tule Lake, and they're trying to save the Lost River suckers. So 
Uh, I'm pretty sure they lived in the Lost River if they were named Lost River Sucker. So I'm hoping that some of that restoration will bolster the population of suckers. And, and I think some of the fisheries people are seeing that um, with the new marshes we've got this year. Uh, there's been some fisheries folks that were impressed. And so it, it is a long game. And, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been working, guiding here forever and just didn't see it going away. So hopefully all these new efforts and maybe some people coming together can save this place. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you coming on the podcast today as, as well as my friends across the table from me. And, uh, hopefully in a couple of years, no, we'll get you, to, we'll get you back on and you. it'll be water everywhere. That, yeah. that sounds good to me. Thanks, Phil. We got to get up there for another field trip. We'll have to, we'll have to, uh, break some bread together. Now you're talking. Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, love to meet with you guys. I'm glad to have uh, been able to speak with you a little bit now and see the efforts that are going on. So, Awesome. Thank you, Phil. We appreciate it. And thank you, guys. Really appreciate you coming in. My name is Carson. Thanks for watching the Save It for the Blind podcast here at the CWA Roseville headquarters. You can find this podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever podcasts are found.